The PJ Flex Show is brought to you by Cub Foods and Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Minnesota. It's the PJ Flex Show with Hobie RT, Ron Johnson, and Justin Gard. Let's row the boat. It feels gutsy. Just gutsy. A lot of you know how hard of a week that that is, you know. Uh, uh, you, you all helped paint the picture how hard that was, right? And that's your job. And you did a good job of that, um, which I give all of you a lot of credit for. Uh, but, you know, this is a gutsy win for us. Winning's fun. I mean, football's fun, too. Like, you know, football, it's not always just going to be, you know, the highs. You're going to have to go to the lows. You're going to have to respond. You're going to have to keep your in the water and keep going. Well, that was a gutsy win, of course, for the Gophers at Purdue as they now go into the bye week with a win, bouncing back from that loss against Bowling Green here on a bye week edition of the PJ Fleck Show. Along with Ron Johnson and KFA and Justin Gard, I'm Hobie Arteague. Coach Fleck, unfortunately, could not join us this week. He's out on the road, of course, recruiting the next group of Gophers to come play at the U of M. But guys, we've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly to start the season from the Gophers. <laughs> what would you say is the identity of this team now that we're five games into this season? I, I, honestly, I don't know. And so there's a thing that I'm perplexed about. In the past, it was a passing team, but we know we had Tyler Johnson, Rashad Bateman, and you had Chris, Chris Altman Bell as that third guy. And then we assumed it was going to be an RPO-style team. Well, then this year, it just seems like, like the Bowling Green game, for instance, it was just we're going to not do enough to show other teams what we can do. Mm -hmm. I don't think teams are watching the game like, oh, did you see what they did against Bowling Green? They're definitely going to do that against us. Right. And so it's tough to understand this offense. Ohio State, it looked great. It looked like they were going to be world beaters, and then Mo Ibram gets hurt. So honestly, I don't know the identity. I mean, it's a team that we know wants to run the ball, yeah. but Tanner throwing the ball less than 20 times a game, I don't know if that's going to be a recipe for success going in some of, some of these shootouts. That's such a great answer, Ron. I don't know. That's my <laughs> answer, too. I don't know. We're still trying to figure it out. We know what they want to be. They want to be a power run team. They want to supplement with the pass when they can. We're just talking about offense, and I know we're going to talk about defense as we go, too, but offensively, I think they are still trying to figure out exactly who they're going to be. We know they want to run the ball a bunch. PJ's always going to do that. Even this last game against Purdue, it felt like they threw the ball a lot. Tanner Morgan only threw it 18 times. It was just, they were taking deep shots, so it felt like they were throwing it all over the place. So I think they're still trying to figure it out. Mo Ibrahim getting hurt, that affects it. Chris Ottman Bell being hurt a couple of times already, that affects it. Dalen Wright not being available against Purdue, that affects it. So I think they're still trying offensively to establish their identity. So I think I don't know is a perfectly reasonable, <laughs> reasonable answer today. I do know that the defense is looking really good right now. We'll get into that a little bit later in the show. But both of you bring up Tanner Morgan. And against Purdue, he looked really good, especially bouncing back from one of his worst games as a gopher against Bowling Green. He responded against the Boilermakers. Here are the stats of his first four games and then the ones against the Boilermakers. Completion percentage about the same, but more yards per game than his average, a touchdown, and also his longest pass of the season. That was a 54-yard shot downfield, one of a few deep shots that he had during that game, as you mentioned, JG. Three passes, though, of 30-plus yards, two of 50-plus in that game, in the rain, no less. Ron, is that enough of a springboard, you think, from what we saw against the Falcons that can help Tanner bounce back into Big Ten play now? Yeah, I think so, because when you watch film, it's like, okay, I know I have Chris Altman Bell back now. I think, like JG said, Dalen Wright, he has to find a home in mm -hmm. this offense. Like, they have to use him. We saw what he can be in Ohio State. But for Tanner, I think it's a confidence builder. Like, so many people were down on him. You know, start Zach Anikstead, run the, you know, let's put Cole Kramer and see what he can do. Mm -hmm. Like, what about these freshmen? It's time to take the red shirt off and let's let them play. I think this is a big confidence booster. And, like you said, being in the rain, I think that's key. But, the, again, the thing for me is – they can't worry about who is not here, which is Rashad Bateman and Tyler Johnson, mm -hmm. and just throw. Like, these guys are on scholarship just like everybody else. You have to test these guys because if I'm Mike Sanford Jr. and that is in my offense, I just have to run it. If the guys don't run it, then at least you can look back and say, hey, we threw these plays and the, got, the plays aren't being made, and then we can move on from that. Of the 18 passes, I want to say about half of them were deep shots. At least that's what it felt yeah. like. And they didn't connect on them. They, obviously, Chris Hopman bell right away, 32-yard touchdown, but they kept going back to that. Mike Sanford, guys, talked about last week. I think I brought it up on the pregame show. Have to have more at-bats. We can't just throw one, you know, one deep shot a half and then go away from it. Mm -hmm. you got to at least have the defense think you're going to go deep, and it was probably the, the, the most deep passes they've thrown in the last two years, and they absolutely have to continue to 
do that, even when it doesn't work. It didn't work every single time, but what I liked about the Purdue game is that they weren't scared to go back to it. I think Bowling Green, PJ even talked about it. We didn't hit on some things in the passing game. I got in my shell a little bit. Mm -hmm. Those are my words, not his. <laughs> but that's what happened. In the Purdue game, even though it didn't work every single time, they kept going back to that well, and that's why they had three explosive passes. They scored on all three of those drives. Right. Yeah. That's not a coincidence. Not at all. Well, here's more from Coach Fleck on how he thought his QB bounced back against the Boilermakers heading into this bye week. Uh, but we gave Tanner time to throw. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought we mixed it really well. And then, you know, when those safeties are buried down in there, you got to be able to make those plays. And we did enough with the schematic part of it to make it not necessarily just one-on-one -on -one mashups, but our wideouts could use their speed and space, you know, run by people, and, and they did a good job making the play. I, I thought Tanner was very accurate today. We had some drops. I thought he threw the ball really well. And I thought he just responded like, um, like Tanner does. And having Chris Altman Bell, of course, a big help. And we saw that against Bowling Green. He gets hurt very early in the game on the first drive of the game comes out. And Coach Fleck told us last week that a lot of the game plan was drawn up around number seven. But I have to ask you too, JG, how dependent do you think this offense is on Chris Altman Bell's availability moving forward with a big chunk of the Big Ten schedule to go? Well, I think it depends on who else is available. Mm -hmm. Like Dalen Wright being back in Texas because of a funeral, that's going to affect things. He's been their number two wide receiver. We think Daniel Jackson might be dealing with an injury. Nobody before the game thought Michael Brown Stevens was going <laughs> to have two catches for 100 yards, right? So it was nice to see him emerge a little bit. But there's no question he's their alpha wide receiver. He's their best wide receiver. It's his turn to be wide receiver one. He waited behind Tyler. He waited behind Rashad. Now it's supposed to be his turn. So you saw in the Colorado game right away, Tanner found him, had five catches. Uh, very impactful there. You saw right away here, where's Tanner looking? First drive, his guy yep. that he's known since they were 16 years old. So he's critically important. They've got other guys that can help him out. But if he's out, you're talking about you know, really good, their best wide receiver. So it's a huge deal to have him available the rest of the way. Yeah, I mean, I would say that, too. I agree with that. You look at the wide receiver one position. Um, but, again, I'm going to go back to the quarterback in this. I, I, I don't think it matters, not to say per se it matters, but who's at receiver. I think Tanner Morgan has some weapons. I think they've done a great job recruiting these guys. But Tanner Morgan being 13th in the Big Ten, that's they're, they're not a passing team right now. I mean, you look before, Tanner was like, you know, top three, four, five guys. We're like, man, Tanner's one of the better quarterbacks in the Big Ten. But, he, but then people are going back to, well, was it the weapons? Was it Tyler and Rashad Bateman? Mm -hmm. You know, is the, was that a one-trick pony where with great guys you just throw passes and all of a sudden you look great? Like Purdue, you know, you look at guys like Kyle Lorton and some of the other guys. Um, was it Drew Brees or was it the receivers? Mm -hmm. You know, I think it was Drew Brees because Purdue receivers never really panned out. Um, same with Kyle Lorton. I think it was Kyle Lorton. Their receivers never, but they always were at the top of the stats at Purdue. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the same thing here. Maybe it's like, was it the chicken or the egg? Is it the receivers or the quarterback? I think it was the receivers. Well, it's good to have weapons. And JG, Mike Brown Stevens played a great game against the Boilermakers. Ron, especially if you have a guy that can take the top off over a defense, Chris Alman Bell can make some of those contested catches. But when you have that speedster, how much does that help Tanner moving forward, knowing that he also has a guy that he can trust to get the ball to whenever it's playing in tough conditions like they were last Saturday? So this is the thing about Tanner Morgan. He is good. Let's say that. Mike Sanford Jr. has to find a way to use the speed. Well, the way to use the speed is you give him a two, you, you put a safety in a bind. Mm -hmm. You send one guy deep, you have a one guy run a deep over. We saw a ton of that with Rashad and Tyler. Rashad will run the deep post, Tyler will run the dig. If the safety gets wrong, Tanner was kind of dialed in. It doesn't feel like he has that every game. Purdue, it seemed like he was kind of there. The ones before that, it wasn't there. So I think it's huge to use the speed. You have to use it because if you don't have a deep threat, if I'm a safety, I'm never going to back up. So if you use Michael Brown Stevens more, knowing that he is a guy that can take the top off, you have to use it because that's just going to create more space for a guy like Ty or, uh, Chris Altman Bell, um, and, and they have to do it. Well, and one other quick thing, Purdue is not going to get beat on the slant again. No, <laughs> after, yeah, no. after getting beat by the slant you know, two years ago when they were there, right. Tanner was 21 to 22. It was slants all day long. That was 2019. Slant, yep. slant, mm -hmm. slant, slant and go, all of that. Right. You could tell they kind of went away from that, the Gophers, because Purdue had two or three guys around every single slant, yep. so they had to do something different, and credit to them, they figured it out. Well, we saw some more receivers emerge in West Lafayette. Here's Coach Fleck on what that can do for his offense moving forward here into Big Ten play. But the good thing about today was we saw some guys emerge. You know, the Michael Brown Stevens, he can play that way. He can run, run. You give him a – I mean, he, he, that's his best game of his entire career, right? And that's the first time he's actually had a lot of opportunities like that. So that helps our pass game a lot. And, and you know, you're, you're watching your guys and you're saying, you know, can they do that? What if they get put in this position and then they have a game like today? That helps everything open back up, especially getting Chris Altman Bell healthy over the next two weeks, which is one of the main objectives.
Some scary news, though, especially on the injury front. Trey Pods, the gopher running back, hospitalized after Saturday's game in Indiana. The school did say earlier this week that he is improving with that unspecified issue. Of course, in a college football season in life, health is a priority. But Ron, whenever you look at the running back room right now, already down Mo Ibrahim, how much would his availability, Potts' availability, affect the offense moving forward if they do have to rely on some of those freshmen? down the stretch huge. I mean, he's the number two running back in the Big Ten, which mm -hmm. is crazy to say that if him and Mo were together, hindsight being 2020 now, they would be the best tandem in the Big Ten. I right. mean, yeah. they would be killing it right now, and it sucks that another guy gets hurt. But that's the name of this game for football. People get hurt. Um, you know, they're saying like a stomach or midsection type of issue, so he could have got hit in the kidney or something, and, you know, something weird like that where if you have a lacerated spleen or whatever, mm -hmm. and it's something they just have to go in, you know, fix up, and then after that it's just rest. And so, yeah, it, it does suck, but a guy like Bucky Irvin has showed he's good. I think this offensive line is good enough that they can create holes for Bucky. He is a little bit more explosive. He is a little bit more quick twitch. I mean, we might find another guy where at the end of this season, you know, kind of like when Marion Barber came in as a freshman my year, we're like, man, where'd this kid come yeah. from? And but not to say he's my, uh, you know, not say he's Marion Barber. People don't <laughs> don't tweet out that I'm crazy, but he could have that kind of success as a freshman, maybe getting a game or two without Trey Potts. Really scary situation with Trey, and you could tell. I mean, whenever you go to a hot the hospital and you're still there a couple of days later, right. athletic directors staying with you, a <laughs> couple of doctors are staying with you, unbelievably scary. P PJ said this summer. We have a pair and a spare and some air when it comes to the running backs. Right. They're getting down to the air now, yeah. though. I mean, Mo Ibrahim and Trey Potts, that was the pair, as you said it right. beautifully. Now we're getting to the air, and they're talented. We've seen Bucky. We've seen Kai. We saw what he could do in Colorado, but th that wasn't the plan going in. So if Trey is not available, and whenever a player is hospitalized, you got to figure it's something serious sure. here. So I wouldn't necessarily count on him. It's, it's a qu another question mark, I think, is the best way to put it. They're talented. Bucky's shown us he can do some things, but it's certainly not ideal circumstances. Yeah. Well, when we come back, we take a look at the Gopher defense that just continues to improve game in and game out. Their numbers, they get better and better, helping to get wins in 2021. But what's next for that group? We discuss that unit and more when we return on this bi-week edition of the BJ Flex Show. Let's row the boat. You're watching the PJ Flex Show. Well, the go for defense continues to improve as the season goes along. The first two games gave up some big yardage, big plays, no sacks. But guys, that's really changed in the last three, giving up nine points per game. A shutout win at Colorado will help do that. 12 sacks, four in each of the last three games, and much, much improved, as you can see, on third down. You could see them bend but not break against Purdue. They gave up a lot of yards but held them to field goals whenever the Boilermakers got into the red zone. What has really stood out about that group, Ron, especially over the last three weeks? I think that's the, the not missing tackles. I think that was the key as PJ brought that up too, is guys wrapping up, not assuming your teammate's going to have it. Mm -hmm. Gang tackle and then you're going to stop. You know, right here you'll see it. One guy forces it in, everybody keeps rallying to the tackle versus one guy makes it hit and everybody stops. I think that's the key. Just make the tackles when you're supposed to. We wondered in the first couple of weeks, who are the playmakers on this defense? I think we've got a lot of those answers now, yeah. and we're going to talk about that here this segment. Up front, you've got a couple of guys. Linebacker, you've got a couple of guys. Secondary members, you have a couple of guys. Guys that can make plays, help ruin games for another offense, and help save games for the Gopher defense. And the Gopher defense had to play a majority of that game against yeah. Purdue without Mariano Sori Marin, so that just adds to the impressive day that they had in West Lafayette. They gave up some yards, but did get the win against Purdue thanks to some timely plays. Here's more from Coach Flick about the way that defense held their own right before the bye. Eliminating the explosive plays, right? And if we could have them put the drives together of 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 plays, but end with three points, we were good with that, right? We were okay with that. And uh, I thought when we needed to make the play, we made the play. Uh, their quarterbacks are very good. I mean, they're 70% passers. Um, their system is very explosive, very good at what they do. Really proud of our defense. They, uh, I'm not into bend, not breaking. Uh, they, you know, we want to always keep people out of the end zone, period. And I thought they did a really good job of that and finished the game. And the takeaways were uh, the, the story of the game, really. Well, looking at each level, Boye Mafe, we knew he was going to be a force to be reckoned with coming into this season, really coming into his own lately, along with countless other players on that defensive line. It seems like every week we're hearing a different guy's name, JG. What is working so well with that group right now where they're able to rotate so many guys in and still find success? That's the key, the depth. Just the numbers. Yeah. They've got eight or nine guys. MJ Anderson's another guy who didn't even play this last week who's shown flashes. And I think, and you would know as a player, Ron, th this makes it, 
I think, better because you, you get your clock, you get your time, you got to go make a play because another guy's coming in for you. And so you're fresh at the end of the game. I mean, they're rotating eight or nine guys on the defensive line every single game. Boye Mafe and Thomas Rush basically play the same position and they basically have the same production. They're both making plays mm -hmm. at, at about the same clip. So the fact that they have so many different options, so many different guys, it's paid a lot of dividends for them. Asezi Otomo is doing really well yeah. as well this season. But, Ron, you look at the back end of that defense. Cody Dorr, we knew he was going to be a leader for that young defensive back group. But we've seen them make plays against Purdue. They would give up a big play, but then Justin Wally would get a nice pass breakup. Tyler Newbin just playing out of his mind the full season, it seems like. Yeah, and I think what you said there is, is Coney Dewar being the captain. You know, he, he's been here, it feels like, forever now at this point. I'm, I'm like, surprised he's still here. But <laughs> when, when you look at him being the leader on that back end and then kind of going down a little bit early on in the season and then being back out, but Tyler Newbin, I think that's the key. You watch the end of that game, that interception, he baited the quarterback. Yeah. So it's almost like they're starting to understand, hey, I'm in cover two, but I don't have to just run off the hash if nobody's threatening my half of the field. And I think that's the things that Flex said earlier before, like Michigan last year, Tyler Newbin ran out of there for no reason and nobody was threatening his half of the field. And mm -hmm. then you see the guy run back across his face and run the post for Michigan. And so I think he's learning and that's the key. They're going to make mistakes, but can you grow and learn? And that's been their response. They've learned their understanding how to set quarterbacks up. They're understanding where they're supposed to be. And I think they trust each other. If mm -hmm. I'm a safety, I have to trust my cornerback. If he's in cover two, he's going to jam the mess out of that receiver. So that he can't get a free release down the field and I have time to set the quarterback up and I think that's the key. Coach Ron, as always, appreciate it. <laughs> but you mentioned bouncing back from mistakes. That's something that the kicking game, both kicking and punting, have done, especially the last game. Matthew Trickett making some kicks in the rain. And how about Mark Crawford, uh, co-Big Ten Special Teams Player of the Week, really pinned Purdue down deep in their own territory. Justin, what do you like about that group? Well, as you head into the bottom. With Trickett, that's why you brought him here. He was the Mac kicker of the year, made two kicks. That was great. Crawford was the story of the game. Averaging yeah. 50 yards, like you mentioned, three of them inside the 15, flipped the field a couple times. Purdue average starting position was their own 18-yard line. That's everything. You heard PJ. Make them go the length of the field. Mark Crawford had the best game of his career. Arguably his best game of the season, too, yeah. after a couple of uh, up and down games. Absolutely. Here with the Absolutely. 37 yeah. yard average going into that game. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe in Australia, it's always pouring rain all the time. That's, <laughs> that's what he needed. He just needed to feel is. like he was at home. Adds a little bit more to the ball's flight trajectory. I yeah, like I that. I guess. Thing. Still more to come heading into this bye week for the Gophers. The Heart of Big Ten play is coming up with seven games to go. What are the toughest three remaining for the Gophers in 2021? Ron and Justin give you their thoughts when we return on this edition of the PJ Flex. Have another ship of the body. To the PJ Flex Show. Let's row the boat. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Seven games to go for the Gophers. It's a tough schedule from here on out because conference, non-conference play is all over. It's all conference games from here on out. And to break it down, Ron and Justin will each pick their top three toughest games remaining. It's big. Ron, let's begin with you. Who is number three on your list? Well, number three for me, I'm going to go Wisconsin. I, I, I don't think, I mean, I think they are one of the top three teams they're going to have to play in the end, but I put them at three just because I don't know what Graham Mertz is going to look like by the end of the season. It's crazy what's going on with Wisconsin right now. I don't think anyone really knows what's happening with the Badgers at this point. Oh, I've never seen a, a team or a fan base turn on a quarterback so quickly. Oh, I have. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I should <laughs> say that. Yeah, I have. Is it my turn now? It's your turn for All number right. three. I'm going, look at this, with the Nebraska Cornhuskers. Watch this Nebraska game against Michigan this week. They're barely favors. Michigan Wolverines undefeated, going to Lincoln. A lot of people are picking the Cornhuskers. I wouldn't have said this a month ago, guys. Nebraska's playing well. Mm -hmm. Their defense is better. They've, they're starting to run the ball a little bit more. That's going to be a tough one. Adrian Martinez playing really well Correct. despite the losses that they have had. Ron, your number two toughest. My number two is going to be Northwestern. Why? Because it's in Northwestern. And we know that is the most boringest stadium at kickoff. It's weird. You don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know what this team's going to look like for the Gophers at that point. I say Northwestern just because of the stadium. If it was here, I would have picked them. Ryan Field, late October. That sounds messy. Ryan Field, anytime. That answer is <laughs> wrong, by the way. Wisconsin is their second uh, toughest game. I think we all know who the toughest game is. Going to be no surprises there, but that's a big one. Should have probably beaten them last year in overtime in Camp Randall. I'm curious to see what they look like all the way here in November 27th. Wisconsin not feeling very good about themselves right now. And I believe the two of you each have the same number one, and it's no surprise. Reveal it. 
with the way the Hawkeyes are playing right now. Sweet, absolutely. sweet black and gold. Yeah, so, it's Iowa. They're good. Yeah, yeah. They're good. That's all I can say. I mean, we know people want to say who hates Iowa. You can't hate Iowa right now. They're good. Interesting game against Penn State. You can watch that on Fox, by the way. Big uh, kickoff. <laughs> big news Sunday. Sunday. Sunday is yeah. going to be there. Um, I should know the name by now. The plug, but. If they get two turnovers the rest of the season, they're probably going to win the national championship, even if they right. only get 250 yards of offense. But they're unbelievable. They're the best team in the West, probably the best team in the Big Ten right now. Whenever you look at that defense, it seems like they're forcing turnovers constantly whenever you flip on one of their games. What do you think could hold the Hawkeyes back at this point in time? Not getting those turnovers. I mean, the Maryland game's a perfect example. It's a good game. It's 10-7. Iowa kicks it off. Maryland guy basically breaks both of his legs. He's done for the season. Fumble at the five-yard line. Two seconds later, it's 17-7. Mm -hmm. I want to see what kind of team Iowa is without those turnovers. It might be that they get them the rest of the season, Ron. They might just right. be the, the Bears of the 2000s Correct. that every game there's a – Or the Ravens of – Yeah, there's yeah. a tipped interception or something like that. But, and that's why I'm curious about this week against Penn State. If they don't get those turnovers, can they win? What do you think about their offense with Spencer Petrus? So I think I was like, I think it's to JG's point. You give them the ball back, uh -huh. the offense looks good. I want to see if they can go an unscathed game, because I think the Gophers are, PJ's the ball's a program. Right. And so he's going to be very, I mean, we know PJ, he's going to be very dialed in about not turning the ball over. This is why they're good. And then the offense is forced to every single drive be efficient. I don't know if Iowa can do that every single drive. They just have had the benefits of, Talia turned the ball over and <laughs> you know and they were able to win it so I, I think PJ's gonna be a little bit better with the ball but you look at that stretch to end the season all of the away games three in a row That's against tough. Iowa against Indiana what does Michael Penix Jr. look like at this point we do not know who and made course, this schedule Kerb Gershman might have he might have yeah, maybe and then the big one against Wisconsin to close out the season that'll do it for this bi-week edition of the PJ Flex Show along with Ron Johnson and Justin Gard I'm Hobie RT we'll see you next time as the Gophers get ready to face the Huskers back at Huntington Bank Stadium next weekend.